discussion on the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we've talked about um, about half of them so far, and today we're going to be talking about faithfulness. So let's begin in the book of Luke, chapter 19, and we will begin there. And when you first read Galatians 5, uh, and the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, when we think faithfulness, um, I don't know about you, but I often first think, okay, faith, like uh, believing in God. Uh, faith is to believe in God. But in that context, faith, so faith has several different meanings, but in that context, faithfulness, faithfulness is a little different than faith. Now, even in the context that we use it, right? How do you guys use the word faithful? Uh, one of the primary ways we use it is in a relationship, if somebody was unfaithful, right? We, that's how we say it, they were unfaithful, meaning they were not loyal to the other partner in the relationship. Um, or to be faithful with something I give you, like they, they, they proved faithful. So the two primary ways in which, so it's different, it's in the original language, it's only one layer that separate, letter that separates the two words. But we're not so much talking about belief when we're talking about faithfulness. We're talking about loyalty and we're talking about stewardship. So if you are given something uh, to take care of, you want to take care of it, right? Uh, don't throw a party and destroy the house. You know, you're not a good steward of something that's not yours. So I began to think about, okay, how can we as Christians prove to be faithful? And what does it mean to be faithful? Um, often we don't really think of loyalty. In fact, loyalty is um, a word that uh, is, is not uh, as honored as it used to be. Um, I don't have a slide for it, but there was a recent survey of people who when think about loyalty, is loyalty a, a quality that you admire? Um, to, in the year 2000, 70% of young people said yes, and 35% of young people today say yes. So a lot less young people under the age of 35 don't really think of loyalty, call it patriotism, or basically loyal to something, right? That, right, I'm willing to quit my job if I need to. I'm willing to bail on this if I need to, right? I'm willing, I'm going to do me, right? I'm going to take care of number one. So the idea of faithfulness is a, is a really important thing, but also it kind of strikes to our heart of like, well, to what are we faithful? To what are we loyal? When do we show loyalty? And here's a really cool parable. I uh, love parables. I was actually, this is really weird, but really cool. Uh, we were at the University of Maryland Friday, and um, some of the, the rising uh, freshmen, the rising first years going, going off to college, so recently seniors in high school came to campus to share their faith with college students and two college students overheard these high school students um, in our church here sharing with somebody else and then they went up to me and started talking to me and they're like are you with those people and i was like i have a decision right now i'm not sure <laughs> I'm like, i don't know what you're talking about i'm not sure i said yeah yeah no they're with us those are yeah they're part of our campus ministry and so we got a question for you and he said i'm trying to understand the gospels and i just can't do it like, what helps you understand the gospel? And I was like, man, that's, that's like never been asked to me before by a stranger. But, you know, he's trying to read. He's like, over the summer, I decided to read the Bible just so I could understand it. And I'm having a hard time. And it's so cool because I was like, well, I, I studied the gospels. That's like my thing. I love the gospels. I love parables. And so I got to gush out, you know, to this guy about parables in the New Testament and kind of why they're so cool because there's layers of meaning. And, and here in this parable in Luke 19, this parable, I got to read this this week and I just, this was just so convicting to me personally and what Jesus is trying to convey. And parables are kind of meant to uh, subvert your expectations. So parables are kind of like jokes, right? Jokes are only funny if there's a punchline. And that punchline is supposed to catch you by surprise. If you know the punchline, the joke's less funny, right? So the, the idea, so surprise is an important part of Common, right? You need to kind of not expect it. You kind of maybe expect it a little, but not fully, right? And so with the parable, it's the same. You kind of think you know where the story's going, but often Jesus will turn it on its head, and you'll be like, you'll either laugh or you'll cry or you'll be discouraged, but you'll feel something because that's the point of telling the story. And here in Luke 19, verse 11, this is a story of the parable of the ten minas or the parable of the pounds, okay? This, I mean, this is just... If you're taking American weight measurements, it's a pound, so it's a weight measurement. Some of us are familiar with the, uh, the, the, the sister parable of this one in Matthew, which is the parable of the talents, similar but not quite the same. Um, and often with even the parable of the talents, 
that's that's a, a, a bummer of a translation because the word talent has nothing to do with your ability to sing or draw or dance. Talent is a is a weight measurement. A talent is a measurement. So if I get the, the, the king giving talents to his people means he's giving them uh, a, a lot of money. Now we read it and we go, yes, God gave me the ability to play basketball. I will use it for him. Right? So we got to be careful, right? Is, okay, the par- so actually a lot of versions, including the NET, have changed it to the parable of the bags of gold. So praise God for that. So kind of like, let's get a real sense of what's happening here. But here is the parable of pounds. And we're going to read it on its own terms. And let's see what you feel, okay? So as you read it, just take stock of what you feel, okay? Just maybe don't shout it out or anything. But, you know, internally become aware of kind of what, what's your heart feeling as we read this parable. Now, right before this, it's important in verse 9. Jesus is in the home of Zacchaeus. And he says, today salvation has come to this house in Luke 19, 9. Because this man, too, was the son of Abraham, for the son of man came, came to seek and save what was lost. Now, that's important because in verse 11, it says, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So we know why Jesus is telling a parable. Because everyone is thinking, man, the kingdom of God must be coming quite soon. Because he just said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come on this house. Also, Jesus is doing things that are very uh, not ordinary. He's uh, saying salvation has come to the house of a sinning tax collector. Okay, so this is all weird. This is new. There's a messianic fervor. People are excited. You can imagine just like maybe 50, 60, 70 people right, are just like, this is the guy. He's doing crazy stuff. He's doing miracles. We're about to go into Jerusalem. It's about to go down. Okay, because that's where the, the religious folks are. And we're about to show them what's up. And I bet the end is near. I bet the kingdom of God is coming soon, whether that be however you might imagine it for them, they were ready. So Jesus thought, you know what? Now's a good time for me to tell a story. In verse 12, he said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then returned. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 pounds. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. I mean, we're going to take this parable uh, piece by piece today instead of reading all the way through. Well, this is important. A man of noble birth is going to leave his country to go be appointed king so that he can come back. And for us, we kind of go, well, what does that even really, really mean? It's important, though, that 20 years before this, this actually happened, like, in real life. There was a man named Archelaus. He, he wanted to be king. But you can't just, like, name yourself king, especially if the Romans are in charge. you got to have the Romans sign off on that, right? It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, like you, among your friends, you're like, yeah, I, I, I don't know, I'm actually in charge. Of I'm going to go talk to the teacher, and then I'm going to come back. And then once the teacher says, like, yeah, you got to listen to me. I'm in charge of this thing. Like, you got to go get authority, and then you come back with that authority. So, the, so Archelaus went to Rome uh, to then come back, basically like, I am king over you. Y'all got to do what I say. I'm in charge of you. And so that's kind of the idea. But while they're gone, they're gone a long time. And, man, you don't want your money just not making money, right? Come on. Money got to be making money. Good business, man. Good business, woman. Let's go. So they leave the money in charge of their, their folks, their servants, their slaves, their, their managers. And say, hey, listen, when I come back, put this, put this money to work um, so that it can, it, it can come back. But we, this is a huge problem, not a problem. It's an obstacle. We read the Bible, and even the English translation, we read it with uh, capitalism overtones, right? So the, 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 the guy here is saying, Engage in business until I return. The literal thing he says is engage in business until I return. Uh, some versions will say, you know, put this money to work, right? Do something, engage with, with, with business in this. But now think for a second. It's not really just about, he doesn't want them to be enterprising businessmen. What he wants them to do, and this is, this is, this is important, in verse 14, it says, But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. Okay, the plot thickens. So we've got three main characters. We've got the servants who have been given the pounds, to, the money to invest. We've got the community who does not like this king. They do not want him to be king, right? So they send a delegation off to Rome to say, listen, I know this guy's coming to you so that he can have power over us, but we don't even like this man. In fact, in the original language, there's not even, not even a word. It's like uh, almost like they hate him so much. We don't want this to rule over us. That's what it says. We don't want this, to, this thing to rule over us. They, they hated this king, that he would leave. They like, please, don't let him be in charge. So now, right, that's interesting. There's tension. Imagine you're given money from the king. and say, listen, here you go. 
I want you to open a coffee shop, right? Maybe you're in Iran, and it's the, the Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini, and he's like, okay, listen, I'm going to go, and I'm going to come back uh, eventually, but I want you to open a coffee shop in my name, call it, you know, Coffee Ayatollah Khomeini, right? I want you to start, um, I want you to start President, President Biden's coffee house, okay? I want you to start President Trump's coffee house. Now, you have a decision to make, right? Because you're scared. You're like, okay, listen, what if he doesn't come back and he's king? Sometimes they come back. Some, you know, Uncle House historically went, he was banished. He was killed. He was not chosen. Herod did the same thing, and he came back as king. And so whenever authority called, I always try to not just kidding. Whenever, <laughs> there's a phone ring. Um, whenever, so <laughs> I tried to work it into the sermon somehow. Well, so either way, you have a decision to make. I have this money. What do I do? Do I actually obey and start President Biden's coffee house? If, President, if the guy comes back and he's not king, I'm in trouble. Because everyone here hates him, and whoever is king is going to kill me. I could choose to not start, you know, President Trump's coffee house, whatever. I could choose not to do it. I could, uh, I could do like an underground business, I'm still making money. But like when he comes back, I'm, it's not as public, right? Like it's not as risky. So I'll do something kind of publicly secretive. I'll do some underground money making. That's smart. Or the smart money probably would do what? Just put the money aside. Don't. Pledge allegiance either side. Don't choose one president or the other. Don't choose one king or the other. Just wait and see what happens. Let's wait to see how this thing plays out. And then if he comes back, we'll figure it out, right? I imagine a lot of us might do that. And so let's see what happens next. And let's see what the servants decide to do with this money. Verse 14, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however. Uh Uh-oh, dun-dun-dun. And returned home. Then he sent for his his servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what business they had transacted or what what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Uh, Well done, good, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. A pound is not that much, right? It's just, it's not that much money. So they've given one pound, which is four months wages. So, Ten cities, right? They were faithful with four months' wages. Now you get ten cities. That's incredible. The second, uh, verse 18, came and said, Sir, your pound has earned five more. His master said, You can take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your pound. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then, did you put my, why, why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I would at least have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his pound from him and give it to the one who has ten pounds. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Epic. A lot of people stay away from this parable because of that last sentence. They, don't, they would rather probably read the other one, the parable of talents. doesn't have that in there as much. But hey, it's the word of God. We're gonna, I think it's here for a reason. We'll figure it out. We're still, it's here for a reason. This is a parable Jesus tells to bring about a certain shock. It is end the way you thought it would. Right, so we have we, they have the guy we probably all would connect with, with potentially, which is the one who says, "I'll be playing it safe, hide the money under my mattress. Let's see how this thing plays out. Whoever comes back king or president, I'll just say, hey, here you go, and I'll play both sides." Now, this is not a parable, right, about being productive. It's not a parable about gaining, even though the passage says, and literally, what the passage says in verse fifteen is to find out what they had done with the money. So, and even this passage, why do we have it, is not so much uh, about the end times. Because remember, the the idea was when people thought the end would come. So what does this passage have to do with that? I think sometimes, and Jesus knew this, that we can get too focused on things that it becomes an excuse to not obey the gospel. And sometimes people can get so caught up in Revelation and the end times and the signs are among us. And, you know, what's going to happen and is the world going to come to an end that they, they they don't actually obey the Bible. I was in a Bible study a long time ago with this great guy, studied the Bible, incredible guy, he's married, uh, he really wanted to get baptized, but he, he, he felt like he had, he had sinned quite a bit against his wife, but did not want to tell her. 
And I said, we could baptize you, but I do think it would be good if you confess these things to your wife. And he completely changed. He shut down. He said, I'm not going to do it. It'll destroy my marriage. Can't we just baptize me? It's fine. I won't do it ever again. It's over. Trust me, she won't be able to handle it. Let's just, let's just baptize. Come on, just please baptize me. And so we didn't. He said, let's take a week. Let's pray about it. But I do think this stuff's pretty big. Like, I don't, I don't think you want to go into the waters of baptism without a pledge of a clear conscience. Let's pray about it. He comes back. He's completely dedicated to a different church now, one that's really, really locked in and focused in on, you guessed it, the end times. And finding out Revelation and what is what are this what are this different lakes of fire mean and the seven and the layers of hell and what is the chariot uh, the, the the death chariot right and the, the ladder from heaven and he's like I want to talk about all these things and I'm like what did you ever talk to your wife he goes no but I really want to talk about these things and I was like yeah but this wasn't important at all in the last few months it suddenly became very important as this great distractor. He would rather talk about this, these, these things rather than talk about, well, what, is, what does faithfulness look like here on earth? What can you do now? And, of course, it's easy to get caught up in those. I'm not saying those things are a complete waste of time. I just think we've got to be careful, right? And Jesus is saying, guys, don't get so excited about figuring out the end, right? But figure out what, you're gonna, what your behavior is going to be like when the end comes. That's what you can control. That's what you can do, right? This guy reached out to me years later. He never got baptized in our church. He reached out to me years later. And he thanked me. Marriage ended up, ended up falling apart anyway. It was really sad. But he came to me and he said, you're right. I, I, was, I didn't want to deal with what was right in front of me. And I think here in this passage, too, we think about faithfulness. We think about loyalty. Loyalty is something uh, that's a real thing, and it's a public thing. So think about this passage is not about uh, whether the guys made money or not, right? That's a capitalistic view. What it is about is whether or not they were willing to be associated with the king. Were they willing to be faithful to the king or not? Were they willing to show public loyalty to the king or not? In fact, in that verse 13, it says, do business until I return. Um, all English translations say do business until I return. But all Middle Eastern languages, Coptic, Syriac, translate that, do business because I will return. And you can translate it either way. The, the Greek word is a bit ambiguous. The idea is, is that that's kind of cool because you think do business until I return is like, yeah, let me make as much as, as I can, you know, with my hard work ethic and, you know, kind of the elbow grease. And let me let me produce. Let me maximize. Let me work hard. Let me gain. Let me uh, be entrepreneurial. Uh, but do business because I will return. That changes it, doesn't it? Do business because I'm coming back, right? Like there's a reason that I'm going to be faithful with what God's given me, the resources that God's given me. And this is a parable, like I said, not about ability, not about talents, not about ability but, ability, but about responsibility and the things that have been given to us and what do we do with them and how do we respond with it? Are you willing to be associated with Jesus or are you trying to play both sides? Are you trying to uh, uh, look both ways and kind of hide the money, do the safest thing? And by the way, the thing that probably is the smart thing to do from any perspective is to try to play both sides and just try to survive. Don't back the wrong horse. Just pick this king or pick that king. But being able to actually uh, choose loyalty, choose faithfulness uh, to God. It's not about profits, but it's about faithfulness. And I think we can maybe even be a little bit scared of that last guy, right? We've got to tease out a little bit of what's going on with this last guy. So the first guy, he's faithful. He says, listen, I made some money. I opened up, you know, uh, a cafe um, I don't know, Cafe Alwyn Kelly, and man, we made some great coffee, some great croissants. It was banging. I'm glad you're king. We made here's the profits, here's everything. All right, you're you're accepted in. You've you've been faithful, right? Okay, I, I opened up the uh, the John Burke laundromat, man, and it was incredible. Or like great deals uh, all the way through. People really wanted there. You know, you did a great job with the dry cleaning. I did it right, and so you've been rewarded. But here comes this last guy. You ever know you're in trouble? Anybody been in trouble before? You ever know you're in trouble, and you're like, how do I, how do I frame this? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you'd be playing outside with your brother or sister when you're kids, and they would get hurt because they're younger and they're little, and they always get hurt. Come on, grow up. Um, you know, my brother would always get hurt, and he had this great ear piercing scream that just like just shocked the heavens, and uh, you knew that okay, he had gotten hurt, and then you, you as the older sibling, you got to go back and tell mom. So you got to go in and you say, you know, hey, mom, um, so everything's fine. Uh, everything's great. Um, I need fire to scream. 
But you know how my brother's arm used to move this way? <laughs> well, it's not doing that anymore. But every time, nobody, nobody's fault. Kids will be kids, boys will be boys, that sort of thing. Um, you know, you kind of like, how do I not get in trouble with this one, right? How do I pitch it? And this guy, it's actually funny. Scholars are divided on if this is a compliment or an insult to the king. I mean, we don't really know what it is. I mean, you can decide for yourself. That's pretty cool, right? You can decide for yourself whether this is a compliment. He says, listen, I, I knew you are a tough guy. You're a hard man. You, uh, you reap what you don't sow, which isn't really a compliment. It's like you take what you didn't earn. I know you're a hard guy. You take what you didn't earn, man. I know that. The king, you're like, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Are you, are you saying I'm too hard and that, that's the re- excuse? Or are you saying it's a compliment? Like, I know you're a, you're a guy who gets stuff done. You know, like you're a tough, you're a go-getter. You're a self-made man. I get that. So there's kind of a, what's he doing here? But regardless of, um, of whether you think he's insulting or complimenting the king, what's, what's really powerful is that this man's failure to be faithful was rooted in his misunderstanding of the king's nature. So because he saw the king as a hard man, a tough man, right, that that affected his ability to be faithful, which means that our ability to be faithful is directly reliant on our view of God. If we view God as a hard man, an unfaithful man, a disciplinarian, unfair, how are we going to be faithful? If we see God as crooked, as uh, uh, inconsistent, as uh, misogynist, right? That will be reflected in our lives, how we, how we live out in our behavior in this world. Psalm 18.25 says, to the loyal, God is loyal, right? But to the crooked, God is crooked. And so sometimes we think, we have these understanding the nature of God is crucial. You know, a lot of times, uh, A.W. A. Tozer said, if anyone wants to get in an argument with you about the Bible, stop. Don't get in an argument with somebody about the Bible. Get in an argument with somebody about Jesus. Right? Jesus trusted the Bible. The Bible stuff, that, that figures itself out. When you view God differently, you trust the Bible. But it's all about that perspective. And so this, this slave, this servant, his misunderstanding of the king's nature led him to live a life of fear uh, or just trying to honestly capitalize and get away with it. Trying to get away with it. And I know for me as a young person, I think that was something that growing up in the church, I had this fear. You know, I was like, man, because people will go up on stage and share their testimonies all the time, right? And they would have these incredibly dramatic testimonies. Like, I murdered 85 people, and I'm here today, praise God. And the whole church would stand and throw flowers at their feet. And I would be like, all I did was disobey my mom once. I don't, I don't know. And I would think, man, I got to go out there and sin so I can have a good communion message. I got to go do some bad stuff, man. Because all I got is like, uh, yeah, I, I think I was uh, uh, prideful at camp. <laughs> on Thursday, you know, and so I could, I could think that, like, man, I'm missing out, and I remember saying that, I'm missing out on the world, I'm missing out on the good stuff, and then if you watch TV, it doesn't help, right, or media, it's like, that looks awesome, that looks great, that looks like there's no, there's no consequences to that, the movie ended, <laughs> you can do all that, you know how romantic comedies always end when they meet, you know, it's like, we met, war credits, that's the easy part, the hard part, right, but so I can do all that bad stuff and not have to, I don't have to ever like have consequences in my marriage? Uh, no. I can do all that. I can treat people like that? No. The, sin has consequences. That sin, that sin comes back around. And it will come back around. And for this guy, I wonder if he thought, ah, he's never coming back. He's, not, he's been away a long time. I'm going to take care of myself. And just in case he does come back, I can, I, can, I can talk my way out of it. I can talk my way out of uh, everything here. He's, got, he's, he's misunderstood who the king is. He's not willing to be loyal to the king. And so the king puts it back on him. Right? So, oh, okay, so you think I'm a, a tough guy. Well, if you think I'm such a scoundrel, if you think I'm so tough, why not at least deposit it and get some interest? I'll tell you why. Because you don't want to be associated with me. The issue is not that I'm a hard man. The issue is you have no faithfulness. The issue is you don't want to be associated with me. The issue is you don't love me. You don't respect me. You don't want to be connected to me. And I think at the end of the day, that challenged me because I thought, man, how many times do I try to play both sides? How many times do I try to get away with it, try to be in the world, try to look cool or look, say something, or, 
even in evangelism, right? You try to be super cool. In evangelism, I'm going to be the coolest person to share my faith. Like, What's up, man? How's it going? I got my, my backwards hat on. What's up? Hey, I just finished working out. Finished 220. Man. Sweet. How you doing, man? You know about God? God's so cool, man. Try to make it all cool, you know? Try to make it because I just want to be relatable. <laughs> I think, man, so much I can be ashamed of Jesus. Just ashamed of Jesus. Why? Why am I ashamed of Jesus trying to play both sides? And I wonder, why am I not willing to put myself out there for him? Now, an important, just important distinction to make as we get to the end of this is that this is not an allegory. Allegory, everything in the parable has a, a direct line to something uh, spiritual. It's a parable, which means, praise God, Right? Jesus is similar to the king in the story, but he's not the king in the story. Because just a few chapters before this, Jesus says, love your enemies, bless those who persecute you. So when the king says, bring in everyone who decided to be unfaithful and didn't want to associate with me and slaughter them before me, right? there's two realities. One is that that's real. An end is coming. And there is a reckoning. Sin doesn't just disappear into the universe. We have, we'd be, able, we'd be held account for everything we've done, whether good or bad, in the body. Second Corinthians 4 says that, right? We're all going to stand for the judgment seat of Christ. Do a study on judgment. It's not a secret. You can debate all day about heaven and hell, but not judgment. Not judgment. It's there. And it's coming. And if you decide to be ashamed of Jesus in this life, he'll be ashamed of you. That's true. That's scripture. We can't hide from that. And there's a good thing. There's a, there's a, a fear in that that's important. We can sometimes shy away from fear, but fear is important. I was telling some brothers this recently. When I was dating, uh, dating my now wife, Jenny, uh, I was in this place where I was considering breaking up with her. It was, I, was, I was being the worst. I was being awful. I was totally taking advantage of her. I didn't really see how great she was. But I decided to go off. I was at this retreat, and I decided to get uh, advice from a few godly men about my relationship. What do you think? And they basically were all like, you are an idiot. She's incredible. You're, you're focused on these little stupid things. Like, these are not, do you believe she'll help you get to heaven? Do you love her? Do you love spending time with her? Is she a woman of God? Like, you, come on, what are you, why are you focusing on these tiny little things? You're sitting on a winning lottery ticket, right? This is, she's incredible. And I had a moment of realization. And you know what that realization was? Fear. Because I thought I might have already lost her. I had been treating her so poorly. I thought maybe she's already given up on me. Maybe she's already going to dump me. And so I drove all the way home, and I said, can you meet me at this coffee shop? And I had prepared what I was going to say, right? And I was like, listen, I've been focused on the dumb things. I don't know why I let these things get in the way, but I love you no matter what. I'm in this no matter what happens to us, no matter whether we're in the ministry or not in the ministry or what we do. I'm with you. I'm in this. I want you to know I'm in this. And that was a turning point for our relationship. But I'll tell you what. You know what got my rear end in high gear was fear. was a realization that I might lose her. And sometimes I think, too, there's a realization that can snap us up. Snap, wake, it can wake us up, especially if we're addicted to sin. We cannot keep, keep continuing. I mean, the numbers are abhorrent. They are horrible. 80% of men addicted to pornography. It is awful. It is into marriages. It is into single, single men. It is in all the way up into people, men at 60, 70 age. I'm sure it's a problem for women, too. I just don't know that part as much. But I know that, church, we got to, where's the healthy fear? Come on, anyone that tramples on the Son of Christ underfoot, right? There's no sacrifice for sin left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God, right? That is real. That is true. The wrath of God is coming. And by the way, wrath is not hate. Wrath is fair. The opposite of mercy is not wrath. The opposite of mercy is indifference. If God didn't care about you, that's hate. When someone cares, right, he disciplined you. There's got to be both. It's balance. God cares. That's why wrath is coming. So there's a reality, too, of, like, we can't try to play both sides. We can't go through life trying to get away with it, you know? Does anybody at your job even know you're a Christian? Does anybody at work know you're a Christian, right? That's the easy part. How about our families? Oh. I suffer. Talking to myself there, right? My my family, how I treat my family, right? My behavior, my neighbors, right? Am I ashamed of the gospel? 
And I want to encourage you with just two last little things. One is, they're not giving much money. So I know a lot of you are thinking, well, it's just I can't. I know I got to go out there and I got to earn a lot. I got I to maximize profit. This is not a parable about profit. It's a parable about faithfulness. And you can, he who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. And so even if you have only a couple of pennies, are you faithful with it? Are you faithful with it? There was a brother uh, down in the Anthony Rose Church, and he didn't have much time, but what he could do was he could set up chairs before church. And he would bring, I kid you not, he would bring a tape measure to make sure that the chairs were equidistant from each other. And yeah, it was a bit much, but he was like, you know what? I'm going to make this awesome. And the seats were pristine. And he set them up, and he took them down, and he's like, I'm not wise. I can't teach people, right? I'm not charismatic. I can't speak. But you know what I can do? I can set up chairs. I can help. And so he who is faithful with little is faithful with much. That brother, he's, I won't say his name, but maybe I will. That brother was Kirk Valencia. He leads, uh, he's led churches, and a lot of you guys know Kirk. He's a fantastic guy, but as a young man, he's like, I, this is how I can give. How can you serve church? How can you be faithful? Be a good steward. Do your best with what you have, even if it's just a little. If you've got young kids and you're like, man, I can I'm just barely trying to get to church. Well, I'll tell you what, getting to church is a stinking victory. So that's being faithful, right? Keep yourself a little grace. It's not, I got to do better. I got to be more. You, you're here. I want to encourage all you today. You're here. That's a good thing. You guys got, there's a lot of reasons you couldn't be here. A lot of reasons, right? But you're here, and I want to encourage you. Continue to be faithful and ask yourself, if I'm not loyal to Jesus, then to what am I loyal? Where do I pledge my fidelity? What do I give myself up for? What do I sacrifice myself for if it's not Jesus? Because I'll tell you what, this king here, we don't know. He, we know that these people are sentenced to death. But we don't know if they actually receive death. The story ends. And most stories, right, and most parables, they end before we know what happens. The idea is that we finish that story. So we are that guy, aren't we? We're the guy who's like trying to trying to make excuses for, to, to God. We're the one trying to wiggle, wiggle out of it. And yet here, right, we see story ends. One chapter from now, right, one chapter from now, you know who's going to be unfaithful? All the apostles. All of them. You know who's going to be ashamed of Jesus? Peter. Peter's going to deny Jesus three times before an eight-year-old girl outside of the Sanhedrin. And the Gospel of John tells us that John, Jesus will look him in the eye when he does it. Jesus sees Peter in his unfaithfulness. And you know what, church? There's going to be times when we are unfaithful. Right? We're not going to be perfect, but I want to encourage you. A faithful, loyal person doesn't give up. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Jesus doesn't slaughter Peter in front of him. Jesus doesn't kill the apostles for moments of, you could argue, pretty significant unfaithfulness. He says in John, John 21, Peter, you're my guy. Be my sheep. Mercy. Right? Wrath is real, but we also have, you know what's greater than wrath is the mercy of Jesus Christ. The grace of Jesus Christ. And that in that, 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 that knowing the grace of Jesus and the character of God can empower us to be more faithful. Because fear can get you started, but it doesn't give you legs, right? It doesn't give you endurance. Fear can get you rolling, but if I, my whole marriage with Jenny was just based on fear, right? Maybe not so great. But it got me moving that day. But then you move into that relationship where, you know what keeps that relationship going is grace, mercy, love, faithfulness. And that's what's beautiful about this story is it does, it does scare us a bit, but it encourages us. God isn't into, uh, well, I just want the church to grow. Or I just want you to be able to produce. Or I want you to be able to look successful or do well. A chapter before this, too, is the rich young ruler. A wealthy, successful young CEO who does not make it. Who knows the commandments. And so we see that the way we view the world, we've got to turn that upside down. And church, what would it look like if we all just with a little bit of faith, a little bit of faithfulness toward what God's given us. And even ask us, what has God given me? He's all given you something, right? You say, well, I'm just a daughter. You, that's a role. To be a daughter is a role. You have, well, I have a sister. How can you be faithful? How can you help your sister? Can you go on a prayer walk this week? Can you ask her how she's doing? Uh, can you read something together? 
can you go and have dinner together? Well, all I have is I don't have much. I just got baptized. I don't know the Bible. I don't know anything. Can you set up chairs? Right? What can you do? The question is, we are, we Satan will throw into our hearts, you're not doing enough. But God doesn't say that. He says, no, what can you do? What can you do? What little bit can you be faithful? And imagine if 270 people were faithful with just a little bit this week. If we were faithful with just a little bit. Right? What could God do through the body? Through what he's doing, uh, through what, what it means to be a Christian. And in this life we live, and I think for faithfulness, loyalty is a big thing. And I want to encourage this as we close out uh, with the words of, um, of a song. But I think what's powerful to me is that this king is similar to Jesus, but he's not Jesus. Um, that Jesus comes back, and he will come back, and there will be a reckoning. Uh, and I want it to be that the whole while, right? We're not thinking about when he comes back, but we're thinking about how to be when he, uh, when he returns. And it was nothing that the slave did, right? It was that he did nothing. It was nothing that the slave did, but it was that he did nothing. And I want to encourage us, don't do nothing, right? Don't do nothing. Put the money on. Engage in business. What does that look like for you? And our king is faithful. Jesus is faithful to us. He, from this moment on, is right into Jerusalem to die for our sins. So we cannot say he is not faithful. The question is, are we going to be faithful to him? And in that great hymn, right, great is thy faithfulness, right? I need new mercies every morning. Uh, morning by morning, right? Uh, new mercies I seek. Um, and all I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, right? And we're going to close out here uh, with a song. Um, not that song, but we're going to sing with all our hearts here this morning. And uh, I'll close out in a prayer. Oh, <laughs>